My name is Travis Marks. Uh, I am the director of Generations University of so the Pension Boards. Uh, this is our learning and education center. Uh, so the Pension Boards has partnered with Ernst & Young to create a series of these webinars for our members on a variety of topics. Uh, today we'll be presenting on the topic of your 2022 financial resolutions. Um, so uh, just a few uh, housekeeping items before we get started. If you haven't already done so, please uh, place yourself on mute. Um, if you have a question during the pre presentation, just use the chat box uh, to enter that question. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session. Uh, we also allow time at the end of the presentation for any questions that come up. Uh, I'll now turn this over to Dan, uh, the Managing Director and Personal Financial Specialist at Ernst & Young. Dan? Awesome. Thanks so much, Travis. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending today. And and for those that are watching this later as a recording, uh, welcome and uh, thanks for joining and, and participating and watching this session. Uh, hopefully it's still early in the year if you are watching as a recording so you have time to, to make some 2022 financial resolutions. Uh, and that is what we'll talk about today, but I want to start as I always do by making sure you understand as we talk finances and financial planning that you're not alone. So we always start by helping you understand the EY Navigate financial planning and education resources that the pension board makes available to all of you. Uh, and you see those resources on the screen. Let me go through those now, and then we'll reference back to those throughout the session, and I'll give you some places to learn more. Um, as a member, you do have free and unlimited access to financial education, financial planning tools, and direct access to financial planners. Uh, that's through the EY Navigate Planner Line, where you can call the special uh, toll-free number you see on the screen, 877-927-1047. It's open 9 to 8, Monday through Friday. You'll be connected directly with one of our EY financial planners, uh, and you can talk to them confidentially and objectively about anything in your financial life. Uh, what we talk about here today, uh, investment planning, retirement, estate planning, insurance, or anything else that's on your mind or concerns that you might have. Uh, there's no cost to you. We don't sell anything. We don't have anything to sell. Uh, the, the fee is paid for by the pension boards, and this is available to you at no cost. Um, so do give us a call if you haven't already. It may be a quick question. It may be a full detailed retirement plan or anything that you might need in between. Uh, for those that would rather do that on their own and, and uh, sort of run the numbers by themselves on a Saturday night, you can do that on EY Navigate Digital. That's pbucc.eynavigate.com. Uh, it's a quick registration and then login process, and you can run a retirement plan, watch our videos or read our articles. Uh, we have monthly webinars that you can sign up for or watch the recordings on. Uh, run any of our 90 plus calculators that may help you in the planning process. And at any point, you can either request access to a financial planner, or if you're working with one of us already, uh, the website is a place to connect back to that planner. You can schedule appointments, you can send them messages and they'll respond and you can share documents back and forth. So that's sort of your hub as you begin working with a financial planner from EY. Uh, and then I, I mentioned the workshops that we do offer regular group learning. We have the monthly Power Up Your Finances sessions that are specific to PBUCC, but for all of our clients and eligible users, we do offer monthly Hot Topic webinars. Again, those are delivered four times a month You'll find them on the EY Navigate website. You can register for those in advance. And then we always post the recordings of those on the website. So you can watch those uh, or rewatch them if you'd like uh, anytime you choose. Uh, in all of my workshops, maybe especially if we're trying to capture some New Year's resolutions, I highly encourage what I call a personal action plan. If you have a piece of paper and a pen or a notepad on your phone or, or tab, uh, write the word personal action plan at the top and and that's and you've got it that's all you need to do but as we go through this quick 30 minutes together uh, i just ask that you you sit back relax listen enjoy ask questions but also write down anything financially that you need to take action on after this session ends as i often say the most important moment of this session will be yeah, around 3 45 eastern today when we're all done we sign off for the day and you go back to your uh, your 10 new emails that have come in in the last 45 minutes, maybe more, uh, and life kind of resumes again. And it's easy to forget about or lose track of what we decided was so important in this session. So jot down those action items. I'll suggest some to you. You may think of your own. And then that's your guide after the session to remember 
what you said you would do, what you committed to doing, and then uh, it's your checklist to make sure that you do those in order over the next few days, weeks, and even over the next few months. So I'll come back to that personal action plan as we go. Make sure you have that. That's the only ask that I have of you. Uh, beyond that, we're going to talk financial resolutions. Uh, it's something that a lot of us do. I don't know where that tradition started. I'm sure some of you probably do know the history. And a lot of those, it seems, are health related. I know mine was this year. Um, I've set a weight loss goal. Uh, and I'm happy to say just by counting calories, I'm about halfway to my goal already. So I have done extremely well over the first 19 days. I've lost 10 pounds uh, and it's gone well. But now I've kind of hit that wall where it's getting a little bit harder. Um, but we don't want to lose sight of the financial resolutions that some make and I think are just as important if not more important. It's really about finding the dollars for all of our future goals. So a lot of those New Year's, New Year's resolutions are to reduce debt. Maybe it's holiday debt, maybe it's long-term debt, to save more, to spend less. But the common theme of all of that is to find dollars, uh, to make sure that those dollars are going to the right things that make us happy today, and at the same time, saving for those future goals. So before you make those financial resolutions, we need to understand where that motivation comes from, what that path or those goals really are. For me, um, I always said I was gonna hit this weight number by the time I turned 50. And I knew that was out there, but you know, when you're 40 or 45, it's different. Well, I turned 50 uh, in about five weeks. So that really brought it home and New Year's was a great time to commit to it. And so that was my motivation for the health goal. Um, we need to find that same motivation for our financial New Year's resolutions. And so in that discussion, as we go through that process today, um, my hope is you'll find some specific actions that can be your New Year's resolutions that you can jot down and take those on internally and, uh, and make them your own. And, and then we'll talk about how we can achieve those. Uh, so it really starts with creating this financial roadmap. And I always... Um, relate this to a conversation you might have with your travel agent, because I think it's the same concept. If you call your travel agent because it's time to take a vacation, you're sick of the snow and you want to go somewhere warm, you say, hey, travel agent, um, can you get me to my vacation? I need your help for flights and hotels and all of that. And of course, that's their job. So my hope is they say, yes, happy to help. But there's two really important things they need to know first. So that third item there, uh, the process, that's what we're all here for. And that's why you might call an EY financial planner. And that's what they could do is to help you with the process of achieving your goals. But they're going to ask the same thing. We need to know those first two questions and get the answers. Where are you now? So if it's the travel agent, what city are you in? And where do you want to go? What city do you want to get to? If I know where you start from and where you want to go, I can get you there. And a financial planner could do the same thing. I need to know where you are today financially and what those life goals are for retirement, for education, for the kids, for a new house, or any other goals you might have, a reduction in debt. If we know that, we can get you there. And then the final step it falls on you, but we're here to help, is to make sure that you stay on course. So again, we're going to hit each of these in turn, and each of these could be its own financial New Year's resolution. So find the ones that are important to you and make this as personal to you as we can. And we'll just take these one at a time as we go. And we'll start with the first one, which is where are you today financially? This is where financial planning always starts. And so we start with these two documents and many of our conversations because that tells us um, where, where you are today, what we're working with and, and what it's gonna take to get you to that ultimate goal. And so that's two documents, it's your net worth statement and your cash flow statement. You've probably heard those terms. Very simple documents, very important to help you get organized and understand your finances today. Your net worth is simply a listing of all your assets, everything that you own and all the details you can, you can provide and all of your debts, how much you owe and who you owe it to and all the details that go along with that. Uh, so if it's a credit card or another loan, what's the interest rate, what's the term, what's the monthly payment, what's the balance today, uh, their flexibility in the payment terms and the interest rate, uh, when is that one going to be paid off? Uh, the net worth statement actually comes down to a single number. It's called your net worth. And if you take assets and the value of assets minus the balance and all your debts, it is a single dollar amount called your net worth. So to me, there's a lot of value in this statement for financial planners, but also for you. We need this to understand, again, where, where we're starting, what we have today to see what we can grow and how much more we need to add. 
If one of your goals is to reduce or eliminate your debts, we now have a very organized list of all those debts and all the details we need to know to figure out which ones to attack first and what that plan might look like. But maybe the most value in the net worth statement is that single number. If you can do this every year, and, and that's the action item I'll suggest, is to do your net worth statement maybe as of December 31st. And then every December 31st, when you get those year end statements in the mail, update the numbers. Once you have it, it's pretty easy to update it uh, annually. Look at that final number, look at your net worth, put it on a graph if you can do that in, on your computer and make sure that that graph is going in the right direction, which means up. If your net worth number is increasing every year, it means you're doing one of two things, but it means you're doing the right things financially. You're either growing your assets or you're reducing your debts, or hopefully you're doing both. And those are really the ultimate goals in financial planning, or at least making sure we're taking the right steps moving forward, is growing those assets and reducing those debts. And if that net worth is growing every year, we're probably doing the right things. Cash flow, very similar. Cash flow is a simple calculation. It's how much money is coming in the door, and then where the heck does it all go? Because it all goes somewhere. We either spend it or we save it, every dime of it. And most of us have no clue where those nickels and dimes and 20s actually go over the course of a month or a year or over the years. We know the big ticket items. We know our income. That's sometimes just a single number. Uh, we know the mortgage or rent check, the car payment, those big things that are three digits. Uh, sometimes we know those down to the penny. But those nickels and dimes and 20s, we often uh, really have no clue. And they're thousands of dollars over the course of the year. So as an action item, I'm going to suggest that you do what I call the notebook method which is for 30 days to jot down every dime that you spend in a notebook, in Excel, somewhere it's easy to track in an app and then categorize it, multiply it by 12 after 30 days. And for the first time in your life, you're gonna see exactly where every nickel and dime and 20 goes. And then we can make some decisions and we'll talk about those and what you'll see in that notebook in just a few minutes. Uh, there are other ways to do that. There's a home budget calculator on the EY Navigate digital site. So you can use the calculator there to help you with this process and understand exactly where your money goes. Um, so that helps us understand where we are today. And we'll come back to those two concepts throughout this short session, but we also need to dream a bit. And this is, maybe this is the most exciting slide in financial planning. This really is asking you to, to sit down and just daydream about your, your hopes and dreams in life. What are your goals financially and otherwise for you and for your family. So I do encourage you to discuss this with your family. One, to make sure that you didn't miss anything. Also make sure you all agree. This is what we want out of life. This is what vacation means to us. This is what the picture of retirement is for all of us so that we can actually see each other in retirement. We don't go off in our own separate directions. So list out your financial goals, your life goals, prioritize those goals. It's, we definitely wanna retire. We wanna put the kids through college. Be great to have a couple of jet skis, but that's maybe 10 or 11 down the list, but it's on the list. So make sure we know which ones we're saving for first. And then make sure you set SMART goals. It may be an acronym you've heard before, um, but SMART is specific. And that's maybe the most important part. Exactly what kind of car, what kind of boat, what kind of house, what kind of picture of retirement do you want? What are you dreaming of? What are you planning for? Make sure that it's a measurable goal. You can put a dollar amount to it. You know when you're going to achieve it, how much you'll need, including inflation and other factors to get there. Make sure it's actionable. Make sure it's a goal you can actually achieve. If you do X, Y, and Z, you can actually achieve that goal. Make sure it's realistic. Make sure it's time bound. In five years, I'm going to buy a new car. It's going to be a red Honda four-door. This is how much it costs. Here's how much I need to save every month. I have a very smart, specific plan to get there and I can get there in five years. And again, have that conversation with your family. So most of the rest of this conversation then is gonna be how we can resolve as a new year's resolution or as just an action item uh, to get there. And that's the ultimate uh, third step in that process. Where are we today financially? Where do we wanna go? That's the fun part. Uh, those are those hopes and dreams in life. And now we just gotta figure out that process from getting to today or from today to those future goals and tomorrow and your financial planners can help you. Lots of ways we can get there. It's all about finding the dollars. That's what New Year's resolutions are often based on. So let's just do that one step at a time, starting with the idea of maybe just spending less. And that's where that notebook method comes back in. 
if we truly understand where every nickel and dime in 20 goes, again, it all goes somewhere. We either spend it or we save it. We can make some intelligent decisions on those uh, on our spending. In our notebook, we're going to see three types of expenses. The first are those things that we just have to have and have to live with. There are certain things we have to buy and pay for to stay alive. We have to buy food and clothing and shelter and heat and a mortgage or rent. And those things we can't do a whole lot about. We can eat out less and save some money. We can refinance a mortgage. Uh, we can live in a smaller house, but those expenses will always be there. You're also gonna see some that you can eliminate right off the top. You know, I can't believe I spend $400 a year on that. It doesn't make me happy. It's just something I do. And I didn't realize it was $400 a year, but now I do. And that one's gone. I found some dollars. Most of what's in that notebook or the calculator or your app as you track those nickels and dimes uh, are the fun stuff, the discretionary expenses that no, you don't need to stay alive, but it sure makes life worth living. And I've never told anybody to eliminate those fun expenses today, just so you can save for some future goal. We may live until we're 90 and we want some money then, but we also have to be happy today. So we've got to find that balance. But some of those discretionary expenses, we might be able to reduce the cost and acquire them differently. Maybe we can exercise at home instead of paying for the gym membership. Maybe we can wash our car at home instead of paying uh, $20 every time we go to the car wash and have it hand washed. There are ways to get what makes you happy, but acquire it differently. But these are very personalized decisions. And I would never um, be bold enough to tell you, you should stop washing your car. You shouldn't go to the gym or you shouldn't have as much coffee at Starbucks because you've got to decide what's, what makes you happy, what's important, what you can do differently. With the ultimate goal though of comfortably finding the dollars for those future goals. Uh, so there are ways to manage your money. Uh, one, a very low tech solution or suggestion is to use cash instead of the credit cards. It feels very different. If you've not tried this, it's just far too easy to swipe a credit card, insert the credit card when you go to the grocery and buy your groceries for the week because you get that card right back. You put it back in your wallet. It honestly doesn't feel like you've given up a thing until that bill comes in the mail. If you pay cash for your groceries next week, it feels very different. And study after study has shown, on average, we spend about 20% more just because we're using a credit card, because it's easier to do. I can throw a couple more things in the card. I'm just going to swipe that card and put it back in my pocket. If I have to count out those dollar bills and try using singles, count out every dollar bill, you'll be surprised at what you put back on the shelf and how different that feels. So it's a psychological approach, but it, it is effective. And I've had a lot of people uh, tell me it, it made a big difference. Uh, there are plenty of apps that can help you with budgeting, including the Live by a Budget Goal on it, you by Navigate Digital. Uh, keep those credit cards in a hard to reach place. Maybe you don't use them as often. Find the ways that work for you uh, to understand where your money goes and try to manage your spending uh, in ways that are comfortable for you. Uh, we can spend less. We can also, of course, try to save more. Uh, make sure that you make savings a priority. When you get paid, uh, either automatically or through your paycheck or maybe through an automatic transfer in your bank accounts or even manually, make sure you pay yourself first by saving first. Set some money aside in your retirement account in an emergency fund or somewhere else before you start paying all the other bills and before you take that money out for some of the fun stuff. And if you can make that automatic, it's just more likely to happen. If there are ways to save pre-tax for things like retirement or healthcare expenses, you save taxes as you pay for things you would pay for anyway. Uh, you save dollars and you find those dollars for those future goals. And then as your pay goes up, as you find more income, uh, make sure that you're saving more to go along with that. If I get a 3% raise and I can put one of those 3% uh, you know, away for retirement, I have increased my contribution for that goal and I'm still ahead on my budget. I don't feel it. Uh, and we kind of have a win-win a, a uh, each time I increase my income. Uh, the third way to find those dollars is to focus on our debt. That's the right side of our net worth equation. Uh, looking at and listing out all of your existing debts, your loans, your credit cards, and setting a goal to either reduce or ultimately eliminating that debt today and then making sure you've taken steps to prevent it from happening again in the future. Now, it's easy to say, just pay as much as you can, pay more than the minimum payments. Financially, that's absolutely true, but there's actually three specific ways that we suggest that you attack those debts if you have them, maybe especially 
if it's a number of outstanding balances on credit cards. Uh, we use the term snowball and avalanche because those relate to calculators on our website. Uh, I'll use different terms. We can use uh, the interest rate method, um, the cash flow method, uh, or the more, maybe it's the more psychological approach of, of just paying off the smallest debts first. Uh, so if you take those in order, uh, the financial answer is to attack the debt with the highest interest rate. You'll save the most money in interest if you are more aggressively pay off the debt, whatever it is, that has the highest interest rate being charged. If you can get rid of that one faster, you save the most in interest. But that one may have the highest payment, it may have the highest balance, unfortunately, and it may be hard to do that. But if you can tackle that one first, it's the best financial answer. For those with significant numbers of debts, uh, eight, nine, 10 credit cards outstanding with balances of different sizes, psychologically, you may find value in just getting one off the list. If I have seven credit cards and I can just get it down to six and then five and then four, it feels like I've accomplished something. So in that case, I may attack, I may tackle the one with the lowest, or the smallest balance first, just to get it off the list, off the board or off that net worth statement as quickly as I can, just to see that sense of accomplishment. And then the third approach is to tackle the one that has the highest uh, required monthly payment. Because if I can get rid of that debt faster, I free up that monthly payment, that cash, that I can now use for other goals. I can save it for a future goal. I can apply it to other debts that I may still have on the list, uh, but I free up as much cash as quickly as possible. So whether it's cash flow, interest rate, or I'm just tackling the number of debts that I have, they all work in reducing and eliminating that debt. And then just make sure that you prevent it going forward. You don't use the card when you don't need to. You've decided as a family when it is okay to go into debt and when it's not okay. You start to build an emergency fund. So if the unexpected happens, there's an unexpected medical bill uh, or car repair, there's money available to cover that expense without going on the credit card. And then we build up that emergency fund again over time. Again, all of these have uh, action steps, have new user resolutions built in to reduce our debt, to build that emergency fund, find the ones that make sense for you. And as we do that, make sure we're focused on our credit, our credit reports and our credit scores. This goes back to step one, where are we today financially? It's important to understand where you are financially, that's your net worth and your cash flow. It's just as important to understand how others view you financially because that impacts more today than it ever has. It impacts whether you get the loan or the new credit card, and if so, what interest rate you're going to pay, whether you get that next job or whether you get insurance and how much you'll pay for that insurance, especially when we talk about uh, insurance like homeowners and auto insurance. Uh, it, it affects whether you get an apartment. Uh, and if so, how much you're gonna pay. All of those scenarios, they're tracking your credit and different types of credit reports and scores for each of those scenarios. So managing our debt, managing our money appropriately impacts not only our net worth, but also how we're viewed and what our credit score looks like. There's two steps to this. The first is your credit report. Your credit report's the boring side of this. It's a very, um, Simple document, but not a real exciting read, but it lists out all of your debts, past and present, uh, whether they're open or closed, whether you have a balance, if so, what's the monthly payment, how well you've done making those payments, are you paying them on time, are you past due on any of your debts, it shows somebody a snapshot of how you today and in the past manage your debts. So the first step is to get a hold of that report, look at it, as boring as that might be, and make sure it's accurate. Make sure all those accounts are yours. If it says you missed a payment, you really did. Make sure there's no debts on there that aren't yours or that the balances aren't overstated. Because the fact is about 85% of our credit reports over time have an error in them. And many of those, more than half of those errors are significant enough to cause uh, a, an adverse decision on getting a loan or a credit card or an apartment or a job or insurance. So we wanna make sure that that credit report is as accurate as possible. Easiest way to do that is a website called annualcreditreport.com. Uh, it's not freecreditreport.com, which is a commercial site, which is odd because annualcreditreport.com is where you can get your free credit report. The government about 12 years ago mandated that all of us have the right to see that report. It's that important. And we can see it once every 12 months from the three main credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. On that website, we answer a few security questions and we can choose any of those three companies and we can get a free copy of our report from Equifax or Experian or TransUnion or all three. So you may go out tonight as an action item and get all three, look at them, make sure they're good. 
I prefer the, the uh, spaced out approach and I, I do one every four months. So tonight I might get the Equifax report and in four months I'll get the Experian report and in eight months the TransUnion report. And then I'll start that process all over again, 12 months from today. I'm on a regular basis looking at a version of my report to make sure there's no identity theft, there's no errors, there's no fraud, that everything is as it should be. That's important because that credit report drives my credit score. Credit score, and there's more than one score that you have out there, but they're all based on the same fundamental factors. They look at whether you've opened a lot of new credit recently, your credit history and how long that history is, how much debt you have and how you do paying it back. Those are the variables that all of these various scores look at in different ways. So my ask of you then as an action item is to find one consistent place to view your score on a regular basis. And it used to be that it was hard to find or you had to pay for it. There was no other way around it. Now it's hard not to see your score. Any bank website that you use, any credit card website that you use, even dedicated sites like Credit Karma and Credit Sesame, if you've heard of those, they offer you free access to your credit score. You may have to deal with some ads around the sides, but you can ignore those. Understand that each of those may be showing you a different version of your score with a different formula, but they all go up and down for the same basic reason. So if you're monitoring that same score and you see that it fluctuates, it goes up this month, think back to the last month or two and what you've done differently financially. Did you open a new card? Did you pay off a card? Did you run up a balance and you didn't pay it off this month? And you'll start to understand what financial actions you're taking uh, and what kind of impact they may have on your score. So as an action item, make sure you see your reports, make sure they're correct, and then understand how that impacts your score and look at your score on a very regular basis. And then finally, and it was the last step in our roadmap, uh, as you develop that plan, either on your own or with your financial planner at EY, now make sure that you monitor and update it on a regular basis. We're happy to schedule, schedule quarterly calls with you to check in on your progress, to help you with that progress, but make sure you understand what obstacles might impede your financial resolutions, and they're different for everyone. For some, it's just laziness. I don't feel like doing that, or I just like shopping. Um, I like the last one, your significant other. Let's make sure we're all on the same page and that we don't have a spender and another one that's a saver. And if we do, and that's pretty common, uh, that we have a conversation around it. If there's not enough money, we need to find those dollars, spend less, save more, reduce our debt, make sure there's an emergency fund. Of all these life goals that we're gonna put on our list, and it's a very exciting process to think about houses and vacations and new cars every five years or 10 years and a retirement, the emergency fund is the most boring goal I can imagine, and it's the most important. To me, it should be first on the list. It helps make sure that an unexpected event like a medical bill, which will happen, uh, doesn't become a catastrophe financially. An unexpected event that we have an emergency fund to cover is just that, an unexpected event, no big deal, it's a blip and we move on and we pay off the bill. Without the emergency fund, now we worry about losing our home, not paying our bills, running up credit card debt, so of all the goals in life, make sure that one's on the list and it's high up there on the list. And then make sure you stay the course uh, by keeping track of your progress, running the budget every month or so to make sure you know where you are financially. I said it up front, the most important part of this session is at the end and we're gonna check for questions. And if you have any, please put them in the chat function. Uh, and then we'll, we'll part ways and it's on you then to figure out which actions you might take, which financial resolutions you can pull from this discussion uh, that you'll take on in the coming days, weeks, and months. So here's a few suggestions on what those could be. I suggest you find at least three of your own or these that you like. Do the easiest one first, build that momentum, but make sure you take action after the session ends. That's where the real value comes in. Calculate your net worth, commit to doing it annually, uh, do the notebook method or use our calculators to know where your money goes down to the details so we can make some informed decisions on our spending habits and make some changes. It's all about finding those dollars. And then do make sure you talk to uh, your EY financial planner or you use the EY Navigate resources, uh, even if that's on your own on the EY Navigate digital website. If you wanna make that easy, I'll ask you to send one text. This is not a subscription. We're not gonna steal your phone number. Uh, you'll get one response back and it's gonna give you two links. It'll give you a link to the workshop evaluation. We love your feedback and it's a quick uh, survey. Uh, but it also will give you a direct link to the EY Navigate website for PBUCC. 
So again, that's pbucc.eynavigate.com. If you send this text uh, to the number you see here, you'll get a link directly. You can click on it if you've already been there, type in your username and password. Otherwise, it's a two minute registration and you could start the planning process now. You can do a retirement goal. You can run a calculator, watch some of our videos or just explore the site. Uh, we do have a question that came in. Uh, I moved, don't have any debt. Credit score went from 810 to 774. How do I find out why and fix it? Uh, one, congratulations, because both of those are phenomenal scores and you're about 50 points above where anybody needs to be to probably get the best rate on their loan or get that job or the best rate on their car insurance. Um, but there's a lot of pride in having the highest score possible. Um, I will say that the credit scores, and there are different formulas, different versions, are very closely guarded formulas. We know a little bit about the formulas and what influences them. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you'll see a score fluctuate, uh, even the, the number of points you've indicated, which is about 30 points, uh, just because of timing. So even if you pay off your credit card every month, the fact that you use it, maybe you've charged up $500, you fully intend and, and will pay it off at the end of the month, they took their monthly snapshot and that credit card company sent the consumer information to Equifax on the day that you had a $500 balance and last month you had a zero balance. Seems unfair, of course, and again, it's just timing. You pay it off, you don't use the card next month, the next snapshot that they send is gonna show a zero balance and that score will go back up. Small changes like that will happen. Um, you know, it, it looks at your credit history. So the longer you've had a mortgage, the longer you've had that credit card open, uh, the, the better it is in almost all of the scores. So every month that score is gonna improve just slightly, uh, just because your credit history is a little bit longer. If you decide to close that uh, JCPenney card because you haven't used it in five years, I honestly forgot you had it. If you close a card temporarily, that can hurt your score a little bit um, because they look at how much you owe versus how much is available. And now there's a less available credit limit compared to what you owe. And that's why closing a card can actually hurt your score a little bit. So again, think back to what you've done. You may have done nothing different at all. It still can fluctuate slightly from one month to the next. Again, the numbers you're sharing with me, anybody would love to have. I will share, um, my dad has never had debt in a day in his life and he does like to pay off his credit cards on a nightly basis. Uh, I don't think he does it for the reasons I shared. I just think he just doesn't like having that debt out there for more than a day. He actually hit 850, which with most scores, including the FICO score, is the most common top score. It's the only time I've seen it. Um, I'm pretty sure he printed it, framed it. It went down the next month for who knows why. It's still in the low 800s. He's still quite happy, but he actually hit that top number. Again, anything over 720, certainly 750. You're in phenomenal shape and well ahead of most of us. So congratulations. I don't see any other questions in yet, but we have a couple of minutes. So I will pause and try to waste time and, and uh, install to see if we have any other questions that come in. Uh, but if we don't, uh, Travis and Ruth, are there any other points to make? Any other questions from you before we finish up? No, Dan, I, I didn't have any others um, at this point, but I know, I know there are people that will listen to this after today's session through the recording. And uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions about the topics that discussed today or related topics, you can always call EMY uh, and they're available to help. Again, it, it, there's, there's no sales pitch involved. They're just they're looking to help you. Uh, yeah. so, so give them a call uh, or check out their website uh, for, for the tools that, that Dan mentioned. Um, there's some really great tools on there. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say again, Dan, thank you so much for your time. Um, this is very general stuff, but, but very timely uh, as we, we enter the new year. So thank you again for, for doing that. We're good. Yeah, I tell you, every day our planners get that call. It says, look, I know I need help. Uh, there's things I should be doing. I don't even know what to ask you. I'm so confused or so lost, but I know I need some help. Can you guide me from there? That's honestly their favorite call because we can ask some questions. We can explore a little bit and we can help fine tune what the need is with you. And they, can, and they can do a lot of good and a lot of help. Uh, so do give us a call, just try it, see what they can do for you. Uh, and then spread the word, tell your friends. Uh, it's the best next step after today is to make it personal to you by talking to your own financial planner. So Travis, I appreciate the time and uh, I don't see any more questions. So I think we'll call it a wrap for today. Thanks again. All right. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. Take care. Bye. Take care.